Jose Maria Cornejo was born from the desire of Chilean-born designer Maria Cornejo to build a layer label that creates sophisticated, beautiful garments by cutting fabrics based on the simplest geometric forms. Zero as a number is as a number that neither adds nor subtracts, and it came to signify a point of departure and was adopted by Corneo as a concept that evokes the essence of her design, uh, cutting, and garment construction and style. It has been said of her work in Maria Cornejo's hands, minimalism is not a bland word. Her clothes have a sleek sophistication and always a sense of surprise. And for Tara Donovan, for over 20 years, has been creating large-scale installations, sculptures, and drawings that utilize everyday objects to explore the transform transformative effects of accumulation and aggregation. Known for her commitment to process, she has earned acclaim for her ability to exploit the inherent physical characteristics of an object in order to transform it into works that generate unique perceptual phenomenon and atmospheric effects. Among her many accolades are her awards of the prestigious MacArthur Foundation's Genius Award in 2008 and MCA Denver's own solo exhibition of her work in 2018. So please give a warm welcome to Maria Cornejo. <laughs> Tara Donovan. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you to Carolyn, Christina, and Mike, and Dylan, and the whole MCA Denver team for making tonight happen. I want to just make one additional um, one additional recognition, and that's Max Martinez of Max Clothing Stores. Without him, we would not be here tonight without his um, his joy, his energy, his chutzpah, and his his devotion and commitment um, to those that he loves um, and to the causes that he loves. So, Max, thank you. Um, and I am extremely honored to be up here on stage with these two fearless visionary women. Um, I will do the least amount of talking in order to catalyze a very, ex um, <laughs> who knows where the conversation <laughs> will go, no pressure. Um, at the very least, we get to look at images of your incredible work, both of you. Um, and I think uh, one of the things that uh, many people might not know um, is that you two have been friends for a long time, and that's one of the reasons why we invited you both to, to be here, to, to be able to tap into the, um, the dynamic that you share. And so maybe if, just to kick things off, um, if you can share just a little bit about how you two met and came to know each other, and if you've ever collaborated on a project together. So can I start with yes, this? Go, go, please do. <laughs> so as they mentioned, I won a MacArthur, and I started shopping. <laughs> the timing is perfect. Genius. But um, I did, I discovered Maria's shop around 2007 or 8, uh, when it was the little shop on Mott Street wow. in New York, and um, started buying her clothes, and I had an exhibition, I think around 2008, at the ICA in Boston, and I had bought a dress to wear, of Maria's, to wear to the opening. And then, you know, this was kind of before Instagram, so there was yeah. like Google Alerts is how you found out when people were at things. And um, there was some kind of fashion event, which maybe you can speak to, but I don't know what it was. But I, don't I saw a photo I don't. of you in my exhibition, and it was like Maria Cornejo. And so I went to the store, and I left you a note. Yeah. And then you very graciously reached out, and then... Yeah. Wait, what does it mean to leave a note? I don't think people in the audience know what that means. <laughs> like, you didn't, like, text her. No. No, <laughs> no I just, like, le left a little note saying, Hi, I'm Tara. You saw my show. Yeah. <laughs> I like your clothes. <laughs> Call me. <laughs> yeah. it, was, it was actually really sweet because we were in Boston to do a show for Louise of Boston, I think, if I remember correctly. And then we went to the Boston Museum and I saw her work I'd never seen and I just fell in love with it. And I was just like, so like, wow, but blown I think, away. I think that's so extraordinary that each of you two admired each other's work before even meeting before the Before we knew each other. Yeah. Behind it. Yeah. But it's, I, I don't know, I just sort of just fell in love with her work and the person. And... Um, yeah, and go. I mean, I think for almost every opening I've ever had, I wear Maria's clothes. <laughs> yes, yes. 
Yeah, so I, I, I have to say I feel really like humble and sort of silly being here because Tara is a real artist. So whenever oh, yeah. I am, yeah, you know, no, it's like that. when I see that talk is well no, no, no. Here. But to be honest, I mean, when you see the work in the spaces in the museum and you're just sort of blown away, it's just uh, it's on another level. Well, thank you. But really also, is. what you do is on another level, <laughs> in that you know, I mean, the, the thing, the reason I fell so in love with Maria's clothes was, you know, we you kind of see this thing on a hanger, you're not really sure, and then you pick it up. <laughs> No, I'm serious, and all of a sudden you're like, oh my god, it's a square with two circles in it. And then you put it on, and it, it, it's in conversation with the fabric that she's chosen, and it like drapes so beautifully, and it's so flattering, and you somehow feel really powerful, like a superhero. <laughs> and it, it does, it, your clothes have, I mean, I, I know many women who would say this exact thing oh, about your clothes. Thank it's, you. It's a, it's a sense of armor. I feel like there's a very specific type of woman who is very drawn to your clothing, and they tend to be kind of strong women. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, I don't know what to say to that. I mean, I'm quite, <laughs> I'm a bit of a nerd. I like geometry. Um, I sort of, I was very shy as a child. I'm not very confident. So to me, clothes, how you come out into the world is the clothes give you that armor, that sort of body armor to go and face the world. If you don't feel good in your skin when you go out into the world every day, then you don't perform. Yeah. And, and I think that's what I try and achieve with the clothes because I am not super confident. So to me, the clothes thing should give you that confidence. I'm confident in a lot of ways, but in, in a lot of ways, I'm really nerdy. Okay, just so you know. <laughs> and finally, at 60, I'm getting more confident. I'm sort of, <laughs> finally. But it's sort of, it's been a process, you know? Absolutely. I think also, um, as an artist, you are always putting work out into the world that is going to be assessed and evaluated by others. So I think despite what you just shared, there has to be a lot of um, confidence underlying your practice, if you will, your creative practice, because otherwise it's, I mean, it, to put something out into the world and to have it be seen and worn and engaged with, experienced, um, experienced in all kinds of ways, there's, there's some fundamental belief that, that you're onto something in, in releasing it into the world in that way. Well, I think it's, uh, for me over the years, it's become something about, you know, you, I can only do what I do and I try my best mm -hmm. and then you put it onto the world and people can like take it or leave it. And as I got older, it's, you know, I remember having buyers come to look at the collection. They would say, you know, I love your collection, but the Italians are in ship, so we're not buying it this season, like Blake's in Chicago or something. And I would literally go back in and cry. But now sort of become, I, I say I'm a bit more Teflon. <laughs> you know, it's like I've detached from it a little bit, so I can sort of say, okay, this is what I do. And I go home, and this is who I am, mm -hmm. and who I am it's not me as a designer, it's me as a person. Mm -hmm. I'm a person, I'm not just a designer. Yeah. Yeah. Tara, do you have a similar? I mean, I approach. completely agree. I mean, I, yeah. I think, you know, it, to kind of build your process from scratch when you're young and you, you kind of develop this language for yourself that you work within. And I mean, I remember my first big show in New York and it was this massive show. It was like the same size as this museum. It was a huge mm. show. And I remember installing it and I was like, wow, people are either gonna love this or they're gonna hate it. And I had no idea what was gonna happen, you know? But it, it's true, you are who you are. Like your vision is what your vision is and you work with what you have. And you know, there's always gonna be some hater out there. Um, and they usually hate it for the wrong reasons, <laughs> which I always find amusing. You know? <laughs> I got a really bad review one time. I had shown the, uh, this pin cube that I made. It's, a, it's all made out of straight pins. And I got this scathing review. And they were like, who, like, basically they said that there was a magnet inside it. And I was like, 
<laughs> just do the research. No, exactly. I mean, how lazy but, are you? But that's yeah. the thing, you know. There's a. Yeah. I have to say though, haters are usually people who do nothing and they don't put themselves into the world. Totally. And it takes a lot of guts to put stuff out exactly. into the world. Yeah. Um, and whether it's good or bad, we put it out there. And it takes a lot of courage just to put it out there. A hundred percent. That's yes. exactly what I. So, so I don't listen to those voices anymore because you know what. Whenever people, comp you know, I hear things and I go, you know what? I'm the one putting my head out on the chopping block. Mm -hmm. yeah. You're not. Right. Yep. Right. And this also is the pen piece, by the way, without <laughs> a magnet. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's it. <laughs> There's no magnet. No <laughs> magnet. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, could, you, could you guys share maybe some, like, formative experience just because you you have now been you know making work and yeah. presenting it and exhibiting it etc for over two decades now but for those who are you know in the audience th there's always I think questions amongst those who are let's say the, the non-creatives like myself that you know how like what are the things the moments that like kind of catalyzed or like pushed you into a certain direction or you know that you look back on and you say oh I didn't know it at the time but that was a really that was like an inflection point for me everything kind of shifted somewhat as a result of that I mean for me I don't know my 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 process really kind of came out of uh, a lot of experimentation and play and kind of embracing failures and looking for accidental discoveries and I mean, those those fundamental things that kind of started are the exact same things that I deal with now. Like it doesn't get easier; it's just it's just the same. And you know, I, I don't know. I think it's there. There's a. I think when you're really an artist or a designer, there's just a drive in you that you you have to do it. There's nothing else that you can do like you you have to do it it's the hardest thing ever sometimes sometimes it's really easy but like sometimes it's it can be just arduous and really painful and you know you kind of go through all these crazy thoughts in your head of like oh my god I'm done I'm never going to be able to figure it out again and and then you figure it out and you're like I'm a genius and <laughs> the, the, you know like it, it's just this constant roller coaster of you know trying to kind of grapple with what that artistic process is and um i think you just have to you have to really want you want you have to really want to do it <laughs> and it's sort of weirdly at least for me and i feel like a lot of other artists i know it it doesn't really feel like a choice mm -hmm. it, it's like it's it's how it's i live path. it's yeah. the only path for me, yeah. I, I think for me, it was when I was actually pregnant with my son, and it was 1997. And I had got in a space on Mott Street, and I wanted to have a creative space. And I did not want to be in the fashion business. I was 35. I'd been in the fashion business since I was 21, and really intense, and I was pretty burnt out, actually. And I just wanted to make something that required no season, no size, no wholesale, no nothing. I could just make something, whether it was a cushion or a, a blanket, and just put it in the store. And, you know, people, uh, and I called it zero because I didn't want anybody to have a preconceived idea of what it was going to be. It was just about the wearer. It was just about whether you loved it or not. It wasn't about me as a person personally and that year I got the space and I was pregnant with my son and my father was dying of cancer and I call it my magical year because it sounds really weird but in a, because I had to stop and be present and I couldn't do anything with the space I thought about what I was going to actually do mm. and when do you ever get to stop and I had that year in which I was pregnant and my dad was dying and I got to be with him. I got to think of ideas. I got to think about how could I get into this and do something that makes challenges me as a designer or as a, just like the geometry of it. Just a bit of a nerd, actually. This is like a puzzle. This is what I'm going to do. And um, just 
from those four geometric shapes what I would make for them from them and depending on the woman's body how it would drape and but you know it was a, I call it weirdly enough my magical year mm -hmm. where I got to be present and really I got to be pregnant I've got to sleep on my sister's floor I got to be with my dad while he was dying of cancer and I got to actually think and when do we get that and do yeah. you, I mean, would you have ever sought that out for yourself, do you think, before you had that experience? No, because I think we were sort of bred to sort of just go from one thing to the next and just to be chasing things and reacting mm -hmm. rather than actually retreating. Mm -hmm. And when I first started, you know, I did not want to wholesale and the stores were coming, knocking on my door, going, do you want to wholesale? I said, oh, I don't want to wholesale. I don't want to sell to anybody. You know, I've been through that loop. I don't want to do it anymore. I just want to make something and put it in the store and, you know, made a rack full of samples and people used to come in and then if they liked them, we made more. And then it got to the thing that, you know, as I was doing it and I had like Barney's come in and they said, oh, we wanted a collection. We're going to, and I said, well, I can't afford to produce anything for you. That was my excuse. And the, the more I retreated, the more they sort of, it's sort of weird how that oh, works. Yeah. Yeah, always. always. Isn't always. it weird how that works? Yeah. And I was like, <laughs> and then it was the same with Colette. And then, you know, I said, I have no money to actually produce anything. And this is what I have. And I'm not, I don't want to wholesale. And then they both said, oh, well, we'll give you, we'll pay everything up front. And Colette said to me, we will give you the windows for fashion week. And I was like, <laughs> moronically, <laughs> I said, oh, Okay, yeah. <laughs> such a moron. Because <laughs> then Not I got sort all. of pulled back yes, in again. That was how, yes, the retreat. Yeah, re yeah and I was like, oh. <laughs> but you know, it's, it's interesting. And what year was that? That was my, in actually when Colette bought the collection, I think I, I still have the original invoice. I think it was 1999. Okay, so not too long after you had. No, I had the store around the year. Okay. And they sort of. Which is, you know, it's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm curious, given these kind of formative moments, and it sounds like, Tara, that your process hasn't really shifted, even from graduate school, where you started that the practice of trying, 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 experimenting, like those exercises almost with different materials that you were curious about, that that's still so, that that persists like even to today. Yeah, absolutely. That hasn't shifted. Um, but I'm curious, kind of everyone's lives have been upended over the last three years, or at least three years ago, all of our lives were upended. And some people have shifted back into old normal, new normal, whatever you want to call it. Um, but I'm curious how the last three years with so many different conditions shifting uh, changing, being upended from the pandemic and all of the ancillary um, uh, kind of events around that. What has changed for you since then or in the, this last three years? Well, it's interesting because I feel like it's it, it's been a trajectory. It's like it, you know, it started out as devastating. I, you know, I have assistants. I was considered a non-essential business. I basically couldn't use my studio. I still had to pay rent on it. Um, so it was kind of devastating kind of financially. I was in the middle of making this big body of work um, and everything just halted. And we luckily had a house out in the country that we went to with our children who were in the fourth grade. And um, and I basically started making sculptures in our yard out of tomato cages because, like <laughs> I said, you know, had to, had to do something. And you know, and it was a it was a really intense time of just kind of like what's going to happen. The art world was really shut down. Um, there weren't a lot of sales. You know, it was just it was very terrifying. And then you know, things started to get a little bit better. Um, you know, went back to New York in the fall. It was sort of, you know, we were still masked, but like could go to New York, go in my studio. I'd lost most of my assistants. A lot of them had like moved back to like where they were from. Um, 
but I still had a little ragtag team and we finished up the work for a show which I had in January of 2021. I think some of the images might be in here. And, but it was, uh, you know, it, as an artist so much, it, like you make this work, you work so hard on it and, you know, the, the process of having an opening and a dinner and the, the celebration around that is really, I kind of took for granted how important it was because I had this huge show and there was no opening, there was no dinner, there was nothing. Um, and, you know, I would like sometimes like post on my personal Instagram, which I have like 200 followers because it's, I, it's only like my friends. So I was like, I'll be at the gallery on Saturday <laughs> from one to four. Like, if you want to say hi, you know, it was just a very strange time. And then basically while that show was up, I moved out of my studio and decided to just not have a studio for a while which was really interesting and my kids were doing homeschool and I bought a little drafting table on Amazon and I, I basically I started making drawings. Um, and I mean drawings in the way that I make drawings in that <laughs> they were made out of woven insect screen and I was like moving the wires of the insect screen because the wire has a memory and it would stay where I put it and so I was I had like tweezers and a ceramic tool and an X-Acto knife and a magnifying glass. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I kind of just got to work. And I actually just had an exhibition of the work that I made during the pandemic, and um, which was interesting. And, and then, you know, in the process, I got another studio and all of that. And I'm, that was like a year and a half ago now. But so, I don't know, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> got all lost in Who my cares? like my pain cave of COVID. <laughs> I was like, oh. <laughs> I think it's more just understanding, um, like to what extent, if at all, did things shift for you in terms? Oh, of Oh right, how that that was my. I'm sorry. Yeah. I, I, but basically, my point is, so now I'm like, I'm all settled in this new studio, and I've kind of shown the work that I made during the pandemic, and which was probably the most like interiorly intimate work I've ever made um, and it, then now I'm kind of back to my old tricks you know so <laughs> it's um, it sort of has come full circle is really my point is that which I think all of us have kind of gone yeah, through that. Absolutely, absolutely and how about for you Maria? Oh my god well I got COVID March 2020, we were in Paris. We were showing the new collection. It was fall, winter, and we came back to New York. And I remember in Paris, everything was shutting down all of a sudden. And it was like, oh my God, the world is, it was just crazy. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember Lindsay helping me with my luggage. There was demonstrations. There was just crazy stuff going on, you know, French always come protesting about something. And got on the plane and I was about to take, I was totally burnt out. I was going through a separation and stuff and I was tired from work and everything. And I was supposed to take three months off, which was gonna be my sabbatical. It was gonna be my fake maternity leave that I never took. <laughs> So I was going to take time off, and I was going to go and stay at a friend's place in Bali. They were saying, just go, just take it. And I was like, yeah, shit, I'm going on my own. And it was going to be a bit of my eat, pray, love. And then we got COVID. And so I literally, I remember... You never got to eat, pray, love? No. <laughs> this is why I'm so fucked up. Uh, so, <laughs> so then what happened was is that... I went to Mexico, I thought myself, okay, I'm not gonna be able to do Bali, but I'm, fuck it, I'm going on 10 day to Mexico, I'm gonna go to Tulum, I'm just gonna do yoga every day. And I got to Mexico, and five days in, my brother was like, you gotta come back, I'm gonna close the borders. And everybody was freaking out, and I was like, but I'm in Mexico getting the sun, and it's vitamin D, and it's gonna make me healthy, and you know, and everybody was freaking out, and then after five days, I had to come back, and. I remember thinking I had sunstroke. <laughs> and then I got home and it wasn't sunstroke, it was COVID. And then I, 
I literally laid in bed for about 10 days thinking, it was actually a bit of an, an amazing time because I realized, I came to terms with the fact of dying. I would rather die in my bed on my own than in a hospital. So that was really amazing. <laughs> Took a lot of Ativan so I would just sleep through it. <laughs> and I thought, excuse my French, fuck this, I'm just gonna sleep. And I, I used to get up and just make myself like ginger turmeric tea and I would go back to sleep and not panic about not breathing. And I just like, I'm just gonna sleep through it. I'm just gonna knock myself out. And I, you know, in New York, it was really intense. You could hear, you it could was hear ambulances. the ambulances and you could hear the panic. And I thought, I don't want to end up in hospital. They don't know what they're doing. And if I'm going to go, I'd rather do it in my own bed with my cats, with my plants. I mean, well, and so the store was closed during Yeah, it was time. closed. And I remember we had, a, a, we had an event on March 9th for Women's Day. And I think we did it with Planned Parenthood. And after that, you know, I'd gone to Tulum and, you know, and we, and we had to close the store down. And I remember saying to Marisha, we have to put my business, I said, we have to put everything in the back because, you know, there's a lot of homeless and if we have to shut down, then we should put everything in the back so it's not in the windows, you know, whatever. How, but long, it, how long was the store closed for? I think it was closed till July. But it was scary. I mean, you know, everybody was looking at us for answers. And meanwhile, we're both sick. Marisha and I were like, both like had COVID at the same time. We were talking to like the accountant. And we, we, I just said to her, I think we're going out of business. <laughs> and she said to me, I think it's going to be two weeks. I said, no, Marisha, this is a pandemic. It's going to be at least two years. Because I'm like, I'm, I'm always like, you know, a bit more Assuming, like. mean, yeah, yeah. The worst. Yeah. Glad, I always, you know, uh, expect, hope for the best, but expect the worst, and somewhere in the middle it will fall uh -huh. because of my background as a political refugee and my parents losing everything and losing everything. So somewhere in the middle it will fall. But then it ended up being, and it was scary because everybody was looking at us, and, you know, and I've been through a lot through by since I was 11. And so has Marisha because in London we went through the IRA, we've gone through many recessions and everything. But for the team, they're all young and they're all like, what the hell, what's going on? And we, it's like, we had no answers. We had no answers and everybody's looking at us for answers and leadership. Well, we have yeah. no answers, you know? And that was scary. And then we had to pivot the whole business into something different. And, and does that like pivot to like an e-commerce and yes, digital? And, you know, uh, yeah, and also more, we ended up doing a lot more like uh, things, you know, like casual, casual things mm -hmm. that people would want to wear because mm -hmm. nobody was going out. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's just really shifted everything. And are you at a point, either of you, where you can reflect back and see how those shifts were, you know, it was pretty dramatic, right? The conditions um, that, that led to these, mm -hmm. these big shifts. Do you think that you would have gotten there on your own? Like, do you think if, if the pandemic hadn't happened that you would have made those shifts ultimately? Or is this just a whole new branch, you know, on the tree? It's a whole new path that, um, you know, the pandemic opened up in a sense uh, because of how we were forced at home, how everyone was at home. And I mean, I, I've thought for a long time that the schedule was crazy, especially uh -huh. for fashion. Yeah. And that's why I stepped away from it once. Mm -hmm. Uh, it was just too much and also you know I always joked about it I just want the cloud to crash because basically <laughs> people need to be present and what COVID gave everybody was presence mm -hmm. and we needed that we needed that reset and I think people were sort of chasing their tail and just reacting to whatever and not really thinking of where they were and I think there was a big time of reflection for everybody and I think that was a magical time as well. Mm -hmm. I got to be with my cats. I came to town to <laughs> dying. <laughs> I, I got to be with my plants, you know. <laughs> yeah, and it was scary, but at the same time, it was, it was an interesting time, and I think yeah. we needed that. Mm -hmm. I think, I mean, obviously now we have some distance on it, so yeah. we can see it in that context. I remember talking to you in the thick of it and, you know, and just sharing, like, how hard it was for every every human on this and yeah, being I mean, on as this a planet. museum director, yeah, as, absolutely. all of it. Yeah, all of it, all of it. Um, I, I think that 
Um, what it, I don't know, one of the things that I took away was the, um, what people love about MCA is not necessarily the experience of being in the building, that, that there was something about the museum and about art and about the things that we value that is bigger than our building. That's what I kept saying. And that's how we were going to kind of find our way through. Mm -hmm. um, and I have to imagine that, I mean, it's hard to, to get there necessarily on your, on your own, but that, that there was some recognition, maybe conscious or not, that y you and your work are beloved and will get to the other side of this, whatever that looks like, even if it, like you can't see it right now. Yeah, I mean, I don't, <laughs> in the in the thick of it, it was pretty terrifying. Yeah, and you know, it's yeah, like, you know, I'm an artist. I'm not, you know, a doctor. Um, you know. Uh, yeah, I mean, we're both. We're not necessary. We we we're a luxury. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're not, you know. And that's why I would say we're not saving lives. We're not brain surgery, but we. We still have to make a living. We have to make a living. And <laughs> we, we also have to inspire and, like, you know, bring joy and thoughtfulness and, yeah. and different perspective to the people who are on the other end of that. Yeah. Well, I think it's about bringing sort of beauty and stuff. I mean, because, to be honest, nobody needs anything, but we, need, we do need beauty because yes. the world is pretty harsh out there. Yes. And I think we need things to sort of inspire us and just go like, wow. Absolutely. Well, I think what is interesting about the two of you and kind of getting back into that kind of more creative zone of things, um, you share some, like the, the kind of core principles of your creative practice are very similar, like simplicity, minimalism, geometry. There's that shared vocabulary of form or design and a real concern for kind of privileging those, those qualities. And so maybe if you can speak to how that emerged for you um, even early early on or how it continues to persist. I mean, we've seen some of the images of um, your, you know, celebrating your 25th anniversary and kind of returning to some of the earlier designs that are those kind of simple geometric shapes. And certainly your work consistently has both interrogated geometric forms and reaffirmed them at the same time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm... I'm I'm nerdy too. I mean, there's a lot of math. And <laughs> May we all be nerdy. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> all I can say. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think something that Marie and I really share is that kind of truth and materials of, you know, where I, I'm working with, you know, a singular material in this accumulative, repetitive way and kind of looking for these physical peculiarities that already exist in that material and I'm just sort of revealing it by mm -hmm. the way that I'm organizing it and you know I think also with you it's like some of your like I've 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 bought enough of your clothes over the years and there's certain cuts where it's the exact same cut but the fabric is different like it might be a yeah. silk or it's like a heavier fabric and and they behave differently but with intent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think in a very oversimplistic way, because I'm not much of an intellectual, it's just the material dictates the shape. And that's so exactly I always what, yeah. start with yes. the material and then it dictates the shape and yeah. the body of the woman. And it doesn't start with an idea or this is like the Spanish collection or this is, you know, the whatever inspired. It's always like a quite internal inspiration. It's yeah. very organic. Mm -hmm. And it's more about, for me, it's more about. Um, the prints, you know, whether it's a reaction against, you know, technology, like the new summer collection is very much about technology and beauty. So there's flowers in the collection, but the fabrics are quite techy. Mm -hmm. And I always like the yin and the yang and the contrast between the materials are things that, you know, you don't expect. Mm -hmm. Like something that feels pretty, but it's in a techy fabric. And I like the contradiction all the time of mm -hmm. like how it fights against each other. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I love a boy and a girl, like the, the androgyny of things, you know? Well, and it's also, it's not even just a blending, right? Mm -hmm. It's a holding two things that are different yeah. in the same concept. Um, but I, I think, you know, to hearing each of you speak, it's really about, it's not applying a vision that you have internally to a material or an object. It's really letting that material object speak, speak in its yes. own language almost. 
um, mm -hmm. to review, as you said, to like reveal itself. And it dictates the final form. Like I'd never have a set idea of what the finished thing will look like. It sort of grows organically and kind of reveals itself through the process of making. So um, I rarely do this, but it's a really, really great quote. So I'm gonna quote it, something <laughs> that you've said, because I think it resonates to both of you. Um, that Maria, you once said, it's not about perfection, it's about trying. Um, and do you feel that that's still a kind of guiding principle for you? And Tara, is that something that lands with you <laughs> as a kind of an anchor of your creative process? I think it is, like I said, we, 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 we make, we, we do things. It's never, it's never, I don't have a muse as an ideal. I, I like to dress all sorts of women, all different shapes and sizes. And to me, it's more about working within that and saying, oh, this is the perfect body, this is the perfect shape. It's, and it is about, you know, including that. And it, is, it isn't about perfection for me. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe perfection in the making. I'm a very OCD about things being well made and mm -hmm. using beautiful fabrics. Mm -hmm. But it's not the, the perfection in the muse in a way, you know, so in that way. Yeah, I mean, I think for me, I mean, I definitely at a point kind of look towards per perfection, not that I'm necessarily achieving that, but I, um, it, you know, like I had mentioned earlier, it's like my, my process is really just, I mean, a ton of failures. Like I, you know, it's like I, not... Oh. Do you have, I have, we have racks of the ugly children that never made it. Yeah, no, exactly. <laughs> like, I literally, my studio, like, not that long ago was full of so many failed things, and it was, to me, the most depressing place on the face of the planet, and I would go there every day, and I was just like, oh, nothing's working, and, you know, then finally, like, something's working, and then I, like, literally every single thing has to be gone like whether it goes in the trash or it gets boxed up and sent to storage everything gets gone I completely reorganize the studio we it like becomes this immaculate place we move walls we do all sorts of things to like kind of make it a new space for the new project and then I kind of isolate that and then it's it is sort of a matter of working towards perfection, but never really, it's you know. So, it's so I, interesting I, my work is very handmade. Yeah. It's all made by hand. It's There's no machine that can do it. So there, there is no perfection. Um, so, yeah. I mean, I went to Tara Space a few weeks ago, and it's so beautiful and clean. And meanwhile, our space, to me, like the clothes end up being very minimal because I'm working in chaos all the time. You came at a good moment. I mean, there's a mess everywhere, there's stuff everywhere, there's fabric everywhere, there's like three seasons going on at the same time, there's fittings, there's production. Mm -hmm. So for me, in a way, with the collection, it's sort of, a, a, I get very like, I need to be in a sense zone to sort of, and I think that's why somebody used to say out the chaos of having children and a home and the chaos of the studio, then I want the collection to be quite zen. Yeah. 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 Because there's a lot of chaos around me. But it's like the chaos is in service of getting to that yeah. zen like point. Yeah. You know, a lot of what you're saying, I have to, for a minute, bring it back to the museum because um, like our core um, program that we do, our core education program is we work with teens and we have a leadership program called Failure Lab. And it's all about foregrounding, risk taking, experimentation, and like we can't, emphasize it and I mean it's literally in the title of the program to really reflect our belief in the import of that as part of the creative process and to really debunk this persistent myth that as a creative as an artist as a designer architect what have you that you have to toil away by yourself alone um, in an I like in isolation mm -hmm. um, and obviously yes you did that during the pandemic but like the point is is that that's not how how no. creativity is expressed for the most part, right? It's not this single artist alone in a studio removed from the world. It's about being really embedded within it and, and taking out of that chaos um, enough to help drive the creative Yeah, act. I mean, I have to say, like, 
I did a book with Rizzoli five years ago for the 20th years. And they, most fashion books are very glossy and very much about the pictures in the magazine. And I really wanted for kids to see the process. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of draping, there's a lot of mistakes, there's the sketches, there's things that, you know, because it's about the process. And yet you see the finished object, but it took a lot to get to that. Mm -hmm. It didn't start like that. And mm -hmm. to get to that, there's a lot of mistakes. There's a lot of ugly children <laughs> that maybe don't make it, <laughs> you know, whatever. We love them all. Yeah, but we love them all. And maybe they'll come back in another season. Yeah. But, you know, the reality, it is the work in progress. And, you know, especially for me as a designer, it's like, yeah, I, I get everything started. But it's a conversation with my team. Mm -hmm. It's something that is a dialogue. It's not like the, it doesn't start as a finished, perfect thing. There's a lot that goes into it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and it's it is important, a process. And I think it's really important to show that yeah. because it's that also kind of de demythologizes, you know, kind of. It's messy. It's painful. Yeah, exactly. You know, I call it inspiration depression. I mean, every year yeah. I just like, oh my God, it's <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> But I also think I hate everything. It's <laughs> extremely important, though, for the candor to be yeah. around that, right? So, so to continue to put out into the world, and Tara and I have had many conversations publicly and privately about this, about how important it is to share how hard it is. It's not mm. just a like purely delightful experience, right? Like it's grueling. No. There's so many. There's so much self doubt and questioning and. That's also part of it. Um, but for those, you know, we have some younger members of the audience here tonight. It's so important from where I sit to make sure that people know that that journey is, it's, is, the, um, is to be expected. And it never gets easier. <laughs> no, it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Well, on that note, I want to take a moment to open things up and see if there are questions from our beautiful audience members and oh Max is here. Uh, Ma Maria's really shy, but I'd like to tell everyone she's dressed Michelle Obama the Queen. <laughs> she is dressed Chloe Sevigny. Dress she's dressed Tilda Swinton, Tara <laughs> Donovan. <laughs> And she has come to Denver, and she has worked her ass off for the <laughs> MCA. Normally, when there's a show, it's a week of fittings. Yeah. And Maria's team and Holly from Boulder have done it like in 48 hours for the team program. <laughs> so, and thanks, Mark. she is a beautiful, Latina, strong woman. <laughs> I found Thanks, out Max. today, and, and it's the same conversation about everyone just going through so much. Yeah. And she shared that he had, she had cancer, and I didn't even know that. And clothes make you feel better. Yeah. And we had three minutes, and within those three minutes, I was like, I'm honored to know Maria Cornell. I'd like to welcome both of you to Denver. We are so honored to have you here. Thank you. My question, Maria, is when I travel, mm -hmm. and I, I always like you are the only one in my luggage, do you do and think through that when you're designing? Because the way I fold, like this is crazy, but just the way I can fold the clothes, they just fall in place and I don't know if this is by design or just the way I'm throwing things in but I would love your comments because it's it's fascinating thank I think you because thank you Tara um, I like traveling I like experiences I also because a lot of the clothing is based on geometry it it falls and it rolls and also the fabric so you know, you can get a lot in carry-on. <laughs> it's amazing the amount of stuff that you can get in. Um, 
But also, I'm, I'm a lazy dresser. I want to feel effortless. I want to feel like somebody said sexy. I don't like the word sexy. I think a woman, when they feel good about themselves, they're, they're sensual. And that shows in a woman. It's not a forced sexiness. And I think having clothes that feel good against your skin is sort of, you know, when you're traveling, you want things that you can trust, that you're going to put on, and they're going to take you from day to night, that you're going to stick out of your suitcase, and that you don't need ironing. I hate ironing, by the way. <laughs> I don't iron anything. Well, it feels like you're wearing the art. It feels like when I'm... When I have your clothes on, like I talk about this to my husband, is do I want a piece of art on the wall, which I do and I love and I appreciate and will always, but I also feel like I'm wearing it when I have your clothes on. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. can see why you inspire each other. Um, this is a question for Tara. What is it like to go to Home Depot with you? <laughs> <laughs> no, really. I, I asked it because it when takes you, a do, do, really do, do, do you kind of long walk the aisle time. And you just think? Yeah, I, I can easily spend three hours in a Home Depot. <laughs> I love that. Um, it, it's funny because I uh, I have a, a very good friend, Katie Bell, who's also an artist, and um, she's my like, you know garbage dump buddy like where I mean I, I drove here actually from Portland I, I did like a road trip and my friend Katie came out and I was like who do I know that wants to see Robert Smith and Spiral Jetty and go to recycling centers <laughs> <laughs> so um, yeah I do I actually I, I, you know I spend a lot of time in Home Depot and uh, yeah getting into the nitty gritty of it and yeah <laughs> I, I just find it amazing that all these things that you find you make these incredible beautiful pieces and then when you look into them it's something that you take for granted that you didn't know that could become that you know and that's quite amazing yeah I mean the thing is when I start out I don't even know that it can become mm -hmm. that you know um mm -hmm. And I'm sure there's tons of things that I miss that I, you know, abandon or sometimes I'll see a quality in something, but I can't make it work as a sculpture. And but then then there's those moments that it's it's all about kind of noticing those kind of fleeting moments and kind of catching them in a way. Well, and, you know, would you have landed on the screen drawings if you hadn't been at home forced to work with? something that was small enough that could fit on the desk. No, yeah, totally. Um, yeah, and I literally, it's, I was fixing a screen. <laughs> and I had, like, I was, like, fixing the screen in our screen door because the kids would always push on the screen instead of the door part. And, you know, it, it had this, like, big bulge, and then finally it ripped. And I was like, I have time. I'll, you know, kind of yeah, <laughs> fix it. And um, so I had the screen around, and it was during COVID. And um, so, and yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, there is something about the, maybe it's just because it's kind of the most recent body of work that I finished, that there, it was, it, there was, it was so intimate to work on those. It was so intense, and it, it required this incredible amount of focus. And I, I feel like my process, and the way that I make things, I've always kind of, you know, it's this idea of like, when your hands are busy, your mind is free. And for me, like the actual making of the work was always kind of the reward where, I, you know, I liked the actual making of it. But when I was making these screen drawings, there were, there were so, they required, I counted all day. So I had to count each square of the, grid of the screen in order to know how to make my moves to um, create these patterns. And I couldn't, my mind wasn't free. I just would count all day. And it, it was, I think it's, I'm not, 
I, I mean, I know how to meditate. I've done it before. I'm not a meditator, though. It's I, My work is kind of my escape. But I, I w at the end of the day, I would just... I don't know, there was like a freedom that I had in my head and it was just from this intense focus all day. And it, not a hard intense focus, just, you know, like a one, two, three, move, one, two, three, you know, and like it's just constantly running through my head. Um, but yeah, I, you know, we land on things um, because they're in front of us and a lot of times they're things that, you know, I, I think that's why a lot of people that aren't even necessarily interested in art tend to be drawn to my work is because they have this, there's this like gestalt moment for them where they recognize the material and then they, they kind of can't believe it. And then there's, you know, an, a personal kind of connection to it for them. Okay, I kind of have two questions. So what's your one item that's like a have to have? maybe when you're traveling for clothes or you for working? Like, what's one thing that it's non-negotiable that you just love? And number two, if you weren't doing what you're doing, what do you think you would do? Oh, gosh, that's a heavy one. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll, I, the first, first question, I don't know. Um, the second question, I know exactly. I would be a chef. <laughs> yeah. Okay, it's, it's, I absolutely what I would do. Uh, for me, it's hard because I have, um, I suppose the foil dress is a timeless thing. It's one of my favorite pieces. I think if I wasn't making clothes, I love gardening. I'm becoming like my grandfather. I love plants. It's quite meditative. It's also something that you feel very rewarded and I always said when I get older and I want to make something just for myself and maybe I'll make ceramics but it'll be something that nobody has to like nobody has to buy it will just be for me like you're still yeah 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 I just took a ceramics class the yeah. whole family did and oh. it was so fun <laughs> yeah no it'd be nice to do something with my hands that yeah. nobody has to like or approve yeah. of because yeah. And it's more for me just yeah. to be creative and stuff. But plants also give me so much. I love plants. Sorry. Um, it's just been really fun to listen to both of you talk, so thank you so much. Um, I was living on Mott Street in Houston in 97. Oh, my god! In that big building on the corner. So I remember your store. Wow. And I also saw your show at Ace. It was an Ace. Oh, yeah. The huge that was, one you were talking that about. That was my first show in New York. Yeah, and I wanted to say that I was one of your fans for sure. I saw that show and was like, couldn't quit talking about it. Told everybody they had to go and see it, and I just loved it so much. So, yeah, that was, it was That's very cool. moving. And, um, but the question I have is that um, I had heard that Ace Gallery would not keep artists, women artists, if they thought that they were going to have a family. And I always thought that you didn't have a family, and it's really cool to hear that you have one. Um, and I wondered, like, how being a parent has affected your artwork, because that's something I'm working with right now. And I mean, I have 13-year-old twins. Um, it was hard. <laughs> but, um, you know, it was only hard for a period of time. I mean, I, I, I got pregnant in the thick of my career. Um, <clears throat> so I was... My boys were born in 2009, and I was, I had a show that started at the ICA Boston that traveled to Museum of Contemporary Art San Diego, Des Moines Art Center, and Cincinnati Art Center. And so I was like very pregnant <laughs> through it all. Um, and I couldn't, I wasn't, there for the install of my show in San Diego because I was just too enormous. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, I never heard that about Ace Gallery. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, we just, it's its my life. I, I made the choices I made. And um, I think for any woman having kids and balancing a career, 
it's a struggle. Um, I have a very supportive husband um, that really helped out a lot. He's an architect and self-employed, so we kind of just made it work. But, yeah. Well, Tara and Maria, thank you both so, so much.